Hi everyone, my name is Chabelli. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist assistant and I make videos about the AA profession from prereqs to how much the salary could be. And over my year as a content creator about this profession, the most common question I have had is, am I good enough for AA school? And people have given all kinds of examples, GRE scores and experience. And so I want to cover my thoughts on what a potentially good candidate could have. But not only that, I want to ask you all, my viewers, do you feel like the AA profession is a good fit for you? Because this is a very strenuous process to becoming an AA. So I want people to think about not only are you good enough for the profession, but is the profession a good fit for you and what you're looking for. Before I get into this video and cover my thoughts, please make sure that you like and subscribe. And if you like this video or have any questions, please let me know by leaving comments down below. All right, so let's get into the video. So three things that I want people to ask themselves before they pursue this profession is, number one, am I an extroverted person? Number two, am I willing to work hard? Number three, am I decent enough at science and math? enough so that I can pass classes. And so I wanna break down those three things that I want people to ask themselves. When it comes to being an anesthesiologist assistant, anesthesia in general has this reputation of being kind of a more introverted, a more quiet side. Of course, patients are gonna be asleep and that's part of our care and job as anesthesia professionals, but there's still a lot of people that we will be interacting with. We interact with nurses, we interact with the surgical team, anesthesiologists, we talk to patients every single day. That is a job. You have to build that trust with a patient really quickly. So there are some social skills that have to come into play with building that trust with it, with a small time frame that we have with patients. There are moments where I feel rushed and I have a few minutes to really talk to patients. And sometimes I have a lot more time to talk to patients, but when I have five minutes to quickly ask people about their medical history and to gain that trust, enough as a provider so that they're comfortable with the procedure. You know, I have to bring those social skills out and sometimes it can be a little bit draining after the day is done and I go home and I feel like I've just used my social battery to make patients feel comfortable, to communicate with nurses, to communicate with my anesthesiologist and to communicate with the surgical team. I'm more or less this introverted person, but I do have that extroverted side of myself. But if I were to be very introverted, that would be something I would have to really think about before I go into this profession. The introverted people can absolutely do this job. I just want people to think about this before they dive into the profession and take out all the student loans. Do your best to get shadowing experience. I think that can really help. There are more introverted jobs that pay well, completely remote jobs that have minimal interactions with people and minimal social skills that are required. So keep an open mind on what feels right in terms of whether the profession is a good fit for you or not, because social skills will be a must in healthcare. And the second question is, Am I willing to work hard to achieve this goal? The prerequisite courses can be challenging, organic chemistry, biochemistry, physics, calculus. Then as an AA student, the didactic courses that we have to take and taking multiple tests within one week and then taking lots of tests back to back, and these are master level tests, it can be very challenging. Most people, I believe, have to put in a lot of hours to get through that part of the program. And then beyond that, as a student in clinic, people are expecting students to come in early to set up the, the airway, to put the syringes out, to talk to patients, to review the charts. So the hours as a student can be much longer sometimes than providers. And so you have to kind of keep on going. And not only are you doing it for free, you're paying to be a part of that. So can you put up with that? Can you work past that? And now as a provider, there are days, for example, today I was in endo. I had a lot of patients I had to meet. I had different anesthetics to provide from sedation to intubation to flipping patients. So those things can be very challenging. Patients, for example, today I had someone that had esophageal cancer and what if I wasn't able to place the breathing tube in and I had to deal with that very quickly and their oxygen saturation goes down. Now I have to deal with it so that it doesn't actually harm the patient. So there are challenging moments from the schooling to now the profession, however, with those challenging moments, it is so rewarding. And I feel like I've grown as a person, so it may not be for everyone, but it is super rewarding. And you really learn how much you can push yourself and how much better you can be. I actually had one student that was recently telling me that he saw a difference in me as a provider. I had him in his first year and now I had him now that he's a second year and he's another year into it and he saw the difference in me. And I feel like 
It is incredibly rewarding, but it is incredibly challenging. So just think about whether you are up for that challenge. A lot of people won't have to deal with the stress that an anesthesia providers will deal with. Until you're in that moment, I feel like you may not ever understand that kind of stress. That's something to think about. People work towards it. So it's not like someone has to do it from day one of anesthesia school, but there are gonna be very challenging steps on this journey and on this goal of becoming a. So I want people to think about whether they are committed to doing that before you take out all those student loans, before you are in a situation that very few people will really get to understand when you're taking care of a patient's life and you are in charge of dealing with their breathing and dealing with their circulation and different kinds of things that a lot of people will never have to deal with. So just think about that. And now one of the things I want people to ask themselves is, am I decent enough at math and science? Because math and science is the academic foundation of this profession. From undergrad to the master's program, it's gonna be ingrained into the courses and the training. So I would say people need to think about how good they are at those skills. And for me, I don't think these skills are necessarily innate, inherited. I myself went through tutors, so I feel like if someone's struggling with a certain course, I would take the necessary steps to take tutors to do more practice and that's what I've done from undergrad to my master's program. I did that for organic chemistry, I did that for calculus, I did that for physical chemistry, I did that for anatomy in my master's program. So math and science is a part of the training. So think about how good you are at those skills and let's say if you have failed a science course a few times, I would have to think about whether I can go through the AA program and get through the academic portion of it without being kicked out because that has happened to people. People within my program in particular were kicked out because of failing, being below a certain range. So I would take the actions to learn how to become better at math and science, hopefully in undergrad, but if it doesn't happen by then, I would absolutely get better at those things by the time I get into the AA program. So very frequently I get the question, is blank good enough? And so that blank is usually things like pharmacy techs, anesthesia techs, nursing, etc. And in my opinion, yes, a majority of healthcare experiences are good enough, whether that's volunteering or whether that's a paid job. I think a lot of these healthcare experiences, for example, a pharmacy tech, an anesthesia tech, a nurse, a respiratory tech, a scribe, a medical assistant, a volunteer transporting patients, an EMT, a dental assistant, all of these experiences sound great. And I think as long as you can apply some part of that job to anesthesia in your personal statement and in your interview, I think that can be good enough. It's fine. You don't have to be any single one healthcare experience. I don't think there's one healthcare experience that people will say yes every single blank will be accepted into this program and we won't leave any more spots for any other people so i think healthcare experience in general is a positive for applicants then it's just up to the person to apply some of the things that they've learned from that healthcare experience to why they want to be an anesthesiologist assistant both in their personal statement and in their interview so that's my opinion but i don't think there's any one program that is exclusively, for example, pharmacy techs or exclusively anesthesia techs ex or exclusively nurses. So just keep that in mind. There is a variety of healthcare experiences that people have done before going into the AA profession. Another reason why I think there's no particular healthcare experience that's better than another is that AA programs are rigorous and immersive. By the end of the program, on average, people have 2,600 clinical hours and students graduate with similar skill levels. I also have encouraged my students to get as many hours as they can while they're students so that they're that much more comfortable. So because of this, I think coming from diverse healthcare experiences, it's okay because of how rigorous this training is. People have asked me the minimum shadowing hours they need to be accepted. My thoughts are to always aim for above average. I traveled across the country to shadow. I know of a student who was accepted who drove hours to shadow and by the end of their experience had 400 shadowing hours. Not only did it look great for their application, but it helped that student confirm that this career is the right choice. So I would at least aim for 20 to 30 if possible. It's not always possible, but I would always aim for the most that I could get in a situation to give me a competitive number and also to confirm that the career is the right choice. A lot of people also ask me, do I have to be a certain major? No, that is not a requirement at all. Now, will it help if you're a major that fulfills all the prerequisites? I think that helps. So I'll give this example of one of my PA friends who, when we were in undergrad, she took a major that fulfilled all these pre-PA 
prerequisites. So that way she didn't have to do a major and also take prerequisites on top of her coursework. So she kind of killed two birds in one stone. Some people may not want to do that, but that could be an efficient way to cover all the prerequisites if you're really set on this path of the AA profession. So I would probably think about that if I were to be an undergrad again. But then again, I'm very grateful that I am a chemistry major and I went through that path and I feel like I learned a lot of really cool skills with that path. So people can do a different major if they choose to and if they have that time to do that as well. So no specific major is necessary whatsoever. Another thing people ask me a lot about is if the MCAT is mandatory and no, it's not. Each school has its requirements requirements and I think more schools are open to the GRE now versus when I was applying. I would absolutely take the GRE over the MCAT if I had a choice. I would take the GRE and of course people ask me how did I study for the GRE. I did Magoosh. I think I had a lot of the skills because of my major covering a lot of like the math portion of it so I didn't really have to study too much for the math portion of it but I studied with Magoosh. I did like a lot of their question bank and I did a lot of their practice tests and I just kept doing that over and over and reviewing the material and then taking a practice test at the end of the week and doing that for a couple of weeks leading up to my exam. So if I were to do it again, I would do Magoosh. I felt like it was a good, efficient way to study and I don't think it was too expensive versus taking out a personal tutor. So that's how I would study for the GRE. Other than that, people have asked me a lot about the GPA and questions about a low GPA. I will say if you are still in undergrad, I would do my best to get the best GPA that I can. I was a big proponent for tutors when I was in school. I always saw it as an investment in my future. So I looked into getting tutors, whether they were free school tutors or private tutors. That's what I did. When it comes to GPA, I would aim to have a GPA above 3.5, trying to be competitive. This GPA may change. It might be more competitive in the future, but right now I hear 3.5 is around a good solid GPA to have. I say 3.5 because I've heard of students, particularly I had one student that had a 3.4 GPA and they were rejected twice. What they ended up doing was becoming an anesthesia tech that ended up helping them with their application. So I think if someone were to have a borderline GPA, having a very applicable healthcare experience can be a boost in the application. For example, an anesthesia tech or a respiratory tech, maybe even a pharmacy tech, it can depend, or a nurse. Those kind of things can help counterbalance the lower than average GPA. However, I think being proactive is always better than being reactive. Overall, I would just say aim for the best GPA you can by either getting tutors or doing practice questions, practice tests. And if you can't get the best GPA or maybe it's a little too late, there is that NOVA post -back program, which I believe guarantees seats to NOVA program. So I think it's like 11 spots or something and then you're guaranteed a seat in an A program. Now it may cost a lot of money. I would think about that too. But if you're a borderline applicant and maybe you've been rejected, but you are accepted into this program, it can be something to think about. So some other things to think about is in terms of extracurriculars, more than likely, if you're still in college, there is gonna be a pre-health advisor that may know of opportunities, whether it's volunteer work or paid work. So if I was still in undergrad, I would reach out to whoever my pre-health advisor is and find out what kind of summer programs they know about or externships, internship, research opportunities, whether it's working in a office, like in a dental office, being a dental assistant, things like that. They may know of healthcare opportunities, whether it's paid or unpaid. The other thing is there should be some sort of clubs within an undergrad. My undergrad had a lot of clubs. I became part of a few and those clubs pointed me towards opportunities, whether it was scholarships, whether it was volunteer work, or whether it was research opportunities in my own college or outside of my college. And that's how I got really amazing, incredible opportunities that I would, I am so grateful for. I made the best out of networking with my classmates, but I also was in a couple of different clubs. So that's what I would do if I was an undergrad again, network with students, maybe they know of clubs or opportunities and they may tell you about things. And I would even think about starting an AA club. I think I've talked about that before, but maybe being the president of your AA club could be a really cool extracurricular to put down on a resume. If there's no AA club, or just even being a member, that could be a cool thing because I'm sure being with other pre-AA people can really point you in the right direction in terms of healthcare experience or volunteer or shadowing opportunities that people may know of. I would do those things to get more extracurriculars to make my resume a little stronger for a school. Okay, so that summarizes my thoughts on if people are good enough. I want people to think about whether this job is a good fit for them before they start to think, are they good enough for the profession? It's not a one-way street. So I want people to think about that overall. 
and that's why I wanted to make this video. I really believe a lot of people have the skills to be good enough. I think it takes determination, hard work, it takes initiative. So without those things, I think it, it can be a huge challenge, but with those skills and determination, I think it is possible for a lot of people. So thank you so much everyone for listening to this video for sticking around to the end. I appreciate you all. And I'm sorry that I don't typically answer people individually on whether they feel like they're good enough. I do think that is very time consuming for me because so many people have asked me. So I really hope that I answered so many questions that people have in this video. If there are more questions, please let me know. Maybe I could do a follow-up about this video. So again, please leave those questions down below. It's also a lot. Sometimes I get like Instagram questions. So it's hard for me to compile some of the questions and requests that I get. So please do your best if you do have a request to leave that within YouTube so I can review it and just add it to my list of questions. But otherwise, thank you so much, everyone. I wish you best of luck and I will catch you in another video.